All right, welcome back. We are now moving on to unit three, and this is going to cover chapter 16. It's a rather large chapter in the book, and I broke it down into major parts of the body systems. And don't be totally overwhelmed by how long the chapter is. Um, we're going to go through the different parts and break it up into smaller parts. And you'll actually identify probably more with this because you have a digestive system and you kind of get a little bit of a better understanding because you can relate it to yourself. So first off, we're going to start off by talking about homeostasis and osmoregulation. So your body has like this internal thermostat. So we're going to talk about how it goes through and regulates things. Um, you know, there are certain conditions that we have to regulate. It can be body temperature, it can be a salt concentration. There's all kinds of different things that we have to monitor. So your body has ways to do this. And then we're also going to talk about osmoregulation. It talks about the urinary system and a little bit more about how you should appreciate your kidneys after this lecture. So let's get into it. So first off, when it comes to organization, this is going all the way back to the very beginning, all the way back to 1408, where I kind of talk about how we go from the very smallest molecules all the way up to an actual organism. So if you think about that, we talked about the elements, and remember protons, neutrons, electrons, all those coming together to make the elements. And then we have these chemical bonds that form between them. So example, a water molecule. Now all these compounds will form together to form the different macromolecules, and we get to eventually where we have the type, a specific type of cells. Now this is a very primitive level, like an organism at this can be at the smallest level right here, be a single-celled organism. But we're going to be focusing on multicellular organisms for the rest of the semester. And when it comes to that, the next level up from the cellular level is actually the tissue level. So basically a tissue is when you take cells of the same type that work together to perform the same function. So you'll have a bunch of muscle tissues. Our muscle cells, sorry, come together to make smooth muscle tissue. So they, I get how they call it a community of cells coming together to form a tissue. Now, the next level up is the organs. So this is where you have two or more tissue types working together to form a certain function. So example right here, they're showing the bladder. So we're going to have skeletal muscle and smooth muscle coming together to form the bladder, which is that one specific organ. Now, an organ could be on its own, but then most of the time you're going to see them come together to form systems. So these are multiple organs working together to perform a related function. So like on this one, you're going to talk about the urinary tract system. So this includes your kidneys, your ureter, your bladder, your urethra, all of them coming together to help function how your body um, eliminates excess waste and water and all the other stuff. Now, all your different systems come together to can create the organism. So all of this is coordinated. It's like a huge symphony going on in your body, and we have to keep it all together. People got to come in at the right time. We got to make sure someone's not playing too loud. It's got to be just perfect. So how is this done? Well, the whole process of regulating that is called homeostasis. So you're going to see a lot of awkward Yeti. I do love these guys. These cartoons are great. Um, just go to the website and you can explore the, a lot of the heart and brain comics, um, but they're fantastic. So you'll see a, quite a lot of these guys. So basically homeostasis is how do we maintain that constant internal environment despite the external changes. So think about you go outside. Um, it's kind of chilly right now. I took the dog out and I'm too lazy to put on a jacket because I'm telling him just pee on the tree outside. But then he's taking forever. So I'm starting to get cold. My body's saying, OK, the external temperature is lower than what you should be at. Um, we're starting to free things. So, you, you know, things are going down. So you start to shiver and things like that. All systems are going to contribute to homeostasis, so we need to bring things to this normal level. So maybe think about the digestive system. We need to bring in new nutrients that are too low. We need to build up something. Maybe you had to build up something that was damaged. Maybe you decided to go work out after doing that big Thanksgiving meal. I'm recording these on Thanksgiving weekend, so maybe you have some damaged sore muscle tissue that you need to rebuild because you decided to work out. Well, you got to eat the right food so you can get the right protein and break it down to the amino acids so we can go back and rebuild stuff. 
We might have to remove waste that are excessive. So the urinary tract will be very important for that because your body cannot keep all this excess waste around. We have to get rid of it. You're going to need the transport materials where needed. This is where the cardiovascular system. Remember, all the cells in your body go through cell respiration. So they have to take in that oxygen, and then they have to get rid of that waste product, which is the carbon dioxide. So they all have to work together. We have to have a way to get all this to the lungs so we, we can do the big exchange. And then we have to regulate the behavior of the other systems. Someone has to be in charge. That's the brain right here. That's your nervous system. Now, most illnesses are attributed to when we disrupt homeostasis at some level. You know, when things get out of whack, that's when we start to see problems. So think about it. You have a set point. Um, blood has a certain pH range that it likes to stay, it should stay at, and they will monitor that. Your human body temperature, um, you've probably heard about 98.6. Um, I actually saw an article in Science Daily where they say it's actually a wider range. Um, some people run hot, some people run cold. You probably know throughout the day you probably go through hot spells and cold spells. Um, like I'm like a little oven when I, when I sleep at night, but then there can be times where I go to bed and I'm like a little icicle. You just never know. And then other one that you could monitor is blood glucose levels. Uh, there's only a certain amount that you should have at a certain time. If you get below, um, you know, your body will kind of recognize that. And then we need to go to the reserves and release some of your stored glucose. So this gets back to feedback loops. So once a change in your environment is made, we need to adjust. So a stimulus is going to happen. And we have this loop that's going to happen. So first example right here, we have a stimulus. What's going to happen? It's going to trigger a sensor. And then that sensor is going to go back to the control panel, which is going to be like your brain. And then that's going to cause the effector to activate. And then we're going to go through and adjust however we need to do to adapt to the stimulus. So here's an example with body temperature regulation. So if your body temperature exceeds 37 degrees centigrade right here, what happened is your nerve cells and your skin and brain sense that. All right, it's getting a little hot and all the other stuff that sends a signal to the control center, which is the regulatory center of your brain. And then what that's going to do, it's going to activate your sweat glands throughout your body. So then you're going to start to sweat. That perspiration is going to cause you to cool. And then what we want to do is call the feedback loop to cause your body temperature to go back down below 37 degrees. So this is a prime example of a negative feedback loop. A lot of the body uses these negative feedback loops to go through this. Your goal is to reverse the stimulus with these. So these are just kind of defining the different parts that I was talking about right here. So body temperature regulation, prime example. If it's too hot, you sweat until the temperature lowers back to normal. If it's too cold, you start, start to shiver until temperature rises back to normal. So these are ways that your body adjusts to temperatures. Now, there are most of the time you think about negative, but there are positive feedback loops. And what they want to do is enhance the stimulus. Now, you won't see these as often, but they do exist. Um, one example is the production of this hormone called oxytocin during childbirth. What oxytocin does is stimulates the contractions. And it will be continually produced until the contractions are powerful enough to produce childbirth. So those first contractions start, and then what that's going to do is trigger more oxytocin to be made. So boom, 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 you want more and more and more to increase it, increase the con con contractions so they get more and more closer together and eventually you'll have birth. So positive versus negative feedback is how your body regulates its overall you know, internal thermostat. So you've seen some of these terms on this slide before, but we divide animals into two big groups based on if they can maintain that constant body temperature. Now, you either can do it or you can't. There's two different types out there. So the first one are the ectotherms. Now, these do not have no internal control over body temperature, and we kind of commonly call them the cold-blooded animals, and they're going to be have a body temperature very similar to the environment. And it's going to be regulated, and they actually go through and regulate this when they expose themselves to the elements. So think about, you know, our little lizard right here. He's cold-blooded. So we have the different things. We have the rising temperature of the day. His normal temperature is at this right here. 
well, he's going to have to go out certain parts of the day to raise his temperature. And then when it's nighttime, he'll go back down. So he might have to go out multiple times in the day to sun himself to kind of warm his body temperature back up. Now we are an endotherm, so we're able to maintain a constant body temperature. There's different ways that we can do that via fur, fat layers, feathers, the process of shivering, and then your circulatory system. It goes through the process of vasoconstriction and vasodilation to help regulate that. And then just plain behavior. You put yourself in ideal conditions. You know, if it's too hot, you're starting to sweat, you go look, go indoors, or you go where it's shady. Now, ultimately, this is all controlled by the nervous system, and the big guy in charge is your hypothalamus. He is in charge of maintaining these set points. So if your hypothalamus is having problems, it's going to affect your overall body. So let's talk about how we maintain the salt and water balance across your body. So together, this is going to be called the osmotic balance. So just looking at what your body fluids are composed of. It's going to be composed of water. You're also going to have electrolytes, which are going to dissolve ions when they are dissolved in water. Some examples of sodium, chloride, potassium. And then you have non-electrolytes, which do not dissociate into ions in water. So example right here, it's like a blood vessel. Inside you have blood plasma. So on one side of this blood vessel, you'll have a set of cells. And inside the cell is called the intracellular fluid. And outside the cell is called interstitial fluid, or IF for short. So there's three big types of body fluids. So there's the blood plasma, composed of these units, intracellular, which is the inside, and intercellular, and they're interstitial, is which is between the cells. Now, if you remember all about membranes, they are semi-permeable, so they can control what goes in and out, and it's all permissible to the size of the solute, um, qualities about it, if it's hydrophobic, hydrophilic, all that stuff coming back to haunt you. But ultimately, you want to equalize solute concentration on both sides of the membrane. So if you remember this, um, you went through it in lab in 1408 where you actually did it to a plant cell where you put it in some salt water and you saw all the water leave the cell. So there's another way you can do this with blood. Here's a cool little video that kind of takes some blood cells and puts it in different solutions. So if the concentration is both equal inside and out, we have what's called an isotonic solution. Now, if the concentration is higher out, the water molecules are going to want to leave to kind of space it out a little better. Better, That's the hypertonic. So water leaves the cells and it causes the cells to shrink. Versus a hypotonic, the concentration is lower inside, so water goes into the cells and ultimately this can cause them to burst. This is a cool little video and actually shows you examples of blood cells going through the different stages right here. So we're constantly taking fluids and electrolytes into our system. I'm sitting here drinking water. I can honestly tell you I'm about to have some wine pretty soon because it is evening time and it's just about time for it. Now we have to make sure we eliminate what we don't need to maintain this osmotic balance. So food and water are going to enter. We got to get rid of the excess. Now we get rid of excess through various methods via sweat, urine, or our feces. Now, if we don't get rid of these waste products, they can build up, and then that buildup can cause tissues and the entire organism to die. So we have some major excretory systems that we deal with in our body. So we're going to talk about the lungs when we talk the respiratory system. Its main job is to remove carbon dioxide and some excess water as you exhale. There is a lot of water vapor in you as you breathe. So hopefully this time you've heard about COVID and how it's transmitted via on water droplets. Well, when you breathe, you cough. Water comes out through your lungs. There's also your skin, and it removes water through electrolytes via sweat. Uh, that's why your sweat's kind of salty. I don't advise yourself to lick yourself, but you're going to see there's a lot of salt within your sweat. And then you probably think about your kidneys. And they, these do is remove waste as urine. So this is how my lungs will probably feel when I go for a nice long walk tomorrow once it warms up. So let's kind of go through the urinary system, and I'm not going to go into extreme, extreme detail about this. I'm going to hit the major parts, what they do, and I have what are some of the problems, and I'll mention that later on.
But if you think about the main parts in the urinary system, you're going to have the kidneys first. So those look like those little bean-shaped guys right there. Now what the kidneys do is they filter nitrogenous waste from your blood. So it's constantly, your blood is constantly being filtered through your kidneys. And it's very important for maintaining this water salt balance and regulating your blood pH. So that's why when kidneys, when you see kidney failure, that's a big indication that there's going to be system-wide organ failure because if you can't remove the waste products from the blood, that blood waste products are going to keep going back to all the different organ systems and we're going to have problems. Now with the waste product, how we get rid of it is via the process of urine. So it's just liquid waste that is produced by the kidneys. Now kidneys will generate this urine and it will go down the ureter, so it's just a tube that carries urine from the kidney to the urinary bladder, and the bladder is where you store it until it can be voided. Um, some people have bladders of steel, they can hold on to stuff forever, other people they have to go as soon as they can, it just depends. Um, it just varies with person to person and with age too. Their urethra, the last part, is going to carry urine from the bladder out of the body. And for you males, it also carries sperm out of your body during ejaculation. So those are the major components, but let's look at the kidney in a little bit more detail. So if we look at the kidney on this part right here, it has three major parts. We have the outer cortex, boom, boom, boom. There's going to be what you call the medulla, which is this inner part right here. And then the renal pelvis right there. So if you look at this, you have a renal vein going in and a renal vein, renal artery. One's going in, one's coming out. So remember, your kidneys are constantly filtering all the blood. So if we zoom in a little bit more in this renal cortex right here, or sorry, the medulla to be more, more precise, if we zoom in a little bit more, within we have these renal pyramids and we have these units that all the work which are called nephrons. Now what nephrons do is they filter the blood in the renal cortex. They're the ones that are doing the most amount of work. And you have about a million in each of your kidneys. And I found this fact fascinating that it filters your blood about 60 times a day. That is just fascinating when you think about it. Now around these nephrons you're going to see a bunch of capillaries. It's going to wrap around the nephron tube. So you, as it goes through the arteries into the capillaries and all the other stuff and then back out the vein, it's going to be filtering out the products that we don't need that's going to be gathered into the cap um, into the collection tube and then that will eventually be turned into urine. So let's talk about the pathway just a little bit. So first off, renal artery enters the kidney. Boom, boom, boom. Blood enters the capillary within the nephron, so it's going to go into these very, 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 very thin parts. Waste is going to be filtered out from the capillary into the tubule system that I had on the previous slide. So then the filter blood is then going to enter the renal artery and should leave. Sorry, my computer's making a bunch of, got a bunch of emails in. So it's going to enter the, within the renal artery. You're then going to reabsorb and secretion occur in the tubule system. So if you want to go back to the previous slide, you can get a little bit more detail, but this is a video that explains it. And like I said, it's more detail than you really need to know. Now urine is going to form and it's going to exit both kidneys via the ureters right there. And ureters are going to move urine to the bladder. Now what happens is you're going to collect in the bladder and then you're going to have these stretch receptors. I said some people have super, super, super stretch receptors. And then eventually when you know it's time to go, you're able to get that restroom, the sphincters relax and urine enters your urethra and exits your body. So this is just kind of explaining the process. Here's a short YouTube video that goes through all the steps. Now if you need a little bit more help, a review on osmoregulation, homeostasis, and the urinary system, here are some review videos. Now I just noticed that I had this last slide misplaced, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But there are some problems that can happen with the urinary system. So renal disease and failure, this is when the kidneys fail to function. Um, you know, as I mentioned, if you're filtering your blood 60 times a day, that's kind of fascinating. And if you're not able to filter the blood, you can't get the waste out, we have a problem. Now, a big one that has affected some people in my family, my husband had them, they're kidney stones. This is what happens when you have a formation of a solid mass in the kidneys. It's also a little calcium rocks. And what it can do is it blocks tubes. And I've heard they are extremely painful. 
I swear it turned him into mush when it happened. These are no joke. I've known quite a few people and they are really, really painful. You can get where you have damage to your nephrons, and this is where the nitrogenous waste cannot pass, and you're going to retain a lot of salt. And then if that happens, you will become unconscious and you'll have heart failure. Now, one way that we can go through about this is going through the process of hemodialysis, is where we use artificial mean machine to go through and replace the function of the kidney. So we're going to filter the blood outside the body, then return it. Now, kidney transplants are very successful, and you know, they it is one of those things. So, you know, if you have kidney problems and you're able to get a transplant, it's a really good idea. If you remember in 1408, one of my um, last discussion posts was talking about possibly using um, or um, chimeras to uh, generate human organs. And it kind of makes you think about maybe that is something that eventually we might be thinking about doing about growing human kidneys in different animals. And as you're sitting there about having, you might be having your coffee, or as I mentioned, I'm about to have a glass of wine. Nephrons use diffusion to move salt in and out of the tubule, maintaining that water-salt balance. That's its whole job. So coffee and alcohol, they actually interfere with that absorp absorption, and we have excess release of water and urine. Both of these are diuretic, so that's when you have a lot of this, because you're also drinking a lot of fluids, too, but it acts as a diuretic, and it causes you to have to pee a lot. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, there were some videos, and then here's credit for the images. So I'll see you on the next one.